Excellent. How's everybody doing? Excellent. <laughs> Good to hear a lively crowd. Uh, on the way over here, I knew I was going out to LA, so I was thinking a little bit about Hollywood, so I thought I should watch a movie on the way out in my airplane there. And I ended up watching a very fitting movie, as this is a Christian talk here. I watched uh, Mary Magdalene, the 2018 version. I have to say, the movie is not as good as the book. Um, <laughs> today, I'm going to talk about how this book, a lot of people think is old-fashioned, the Bible, uh, is really absolutely cutting edge. It's, um, it's an incredible work of art. It talks about what's the most meaningful thing in the world to us. It talks about the power of love to transform our lives like nothing else can. Now, a lot of people, even people who aren't religious, some people think that Christ Jesus was the most influential person who ever lived. I was recently reading a historian who is an atheist who had that very opinion, thought he was the most influential person in human history. Imagine if someone came along today and they made such a difference that we said, okay, we're going to turn our clocks back to zero. <laughs> Everything is different. That's essentially what happened with him. And I've always wanted to look in the dictionary under the word love and see the definition, see the life of Jesus. Because <laughs> I think that would be the, the perfect definition there. Even that movie I watched on the plane, they were just, you could see, you know, kind of the director's eye as you watched it. He was trying to depict real love and doing the best that he could. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is not just universal, unconditional, true love, the love that we could call God itself, but I'm going to talk about Christian science. Now, a lot of people, when they hear those two words together, it's like cognitive dissonance. It's, it's like you can't put those two things together. They're absolute opposites. But for me, they're the most powerful marrying of any two words in the human language. Because for me, Christianity is, is about the life of Jesus where the reality, the actuality, the depth, the purity, the power of love came to life in a full capacity for us to see and know. And for me, science, when, when people talk about really knowing something, that's the word they often use, science. And it comes from a Latin word that just means knowledge. And when Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, I think he was talking about unconditional, pure, divine love, the love that is God. You will know love, and love will set you free. Uh, before I... Well, speaking today, I, I talked to a little, uh, talked to one of the church members of this church about homelessness, and apparently that's a problem out here. And anyone I think who professes to be a Christian uh, cares when they see someone who's homeless. I think of talks like this actually as coming home events, as events where we can come back home to what is real and true and good about each and every one of us, and find that we are valued, we are worthy. We do deserve home in every sense of that word. It reminded me, this conversation, of an experience I had some years ago where uh, on my way home from work every day, I would pass this homeless man who seemed to be mentally ill. And he was always kind of muttering to himself, and my heart just went out to him. And so often I would think of things that had inspired me in the Bible, and often I would think of also things that inspired me in this commentary book to the Bible called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, a book that really unlocks the spiritual meaning of the Bible, helps us have that same mind that was also in Christ Jesus, to begin to see the world and perceive it as he did, as, uh, through the eyes of divine love. And when I passed by this homeless man, my heart would go out, and I would often want to share something with him, and I often tried to share some loving words, some good ideas with him. And if I ever did he would just kind of lash out at me, either with lots of curse words or sometimes with uh, actions that seemed to be violent. And I, I became quite afraid of him, actually. But every time I saw him, my heart would go out, and I would try to say something, and then I would get this verbal abuse, if not uh, uh, some physical abuse, or at least the attempt at it, back at me. Now, this happened for weeks. Every day I would try to share something. Every day this kind of aggressive negativity would come back at me. And then one day I just put my foot down. And there's a little verse in the Bible that essentially says there's two men in a the field. One will be taken 
the other one will be left. And there's a lot of weird apocalyptic movies these days in Hollywood about you know, the end times. I think there's the Infinity War, the Avengers movie, about where half the population is taken. Uh, I think the second, grossest, um, second highest um, grossing film of all time, I think. Um, many movies like that, but that's not what the Bible means. <laughs> if you read this book, Science and Health, the Key to the Scriptures, helps you interpret the Bible spiritually. In a verse like that, there are many like it in the Bible that show us kind of two visions of life, two, like a, a material view of someone and a spiritual view of someone. And I realized I was holding kind of two views in my thought about this man. One, that he was this discordant, mortal, who had these problems, and then I was trying to see him as Jesus might have, as this emanation of love, as a spiritual, a beautiful spiritual idea of God. I'm going to talk about how to think that way and why it matters and why it's logical as we move forward in this lecture. But in that moment, I put my foot down and realized there could only be one of him. The very first uh, page in the Bible says we are the image and likeness of God. Now, I was seeing an image of an incomplete homeless man, but I was trying to hold this image in my thought of love. But there was a moment, there was a breakthrough moment where I realized there really was only one of him. It's kind of like when we see a flat earth and we're walking around, and, but we know that the earth is a sphere. And then there kind of dawns on you sometime that, oh, even though it appears to be flat, it's always a sphere the, all, the whole time, even though I saw other uh, visuals from a myopic, limited point of view, they were never true. And I realized, oh, it was never true that this person was unloved or incomplete or anything. And it really dawned on me with power. And I just held on to that all night. I prayed about this man. And then the next day, when I saw him for the first time, instead of lashing out at me or saying gibberish to himself, he all of a sudden had this beautiful, lucid thought. And he was asking me questions. And we kind of became friends. We had a nice talk. And from that moment on, his favorite place to hang out was not a few streets over, but was right on my front steps. <laughs> and I found out sometimes when you love your neighbor as yourself, you find yourself acquiring a new neighbor. <laughs> and the story really came full circle because I could hear him. This was in the summer. And I could hear him often talking out on the front steps to people who would walk by. And you know, I had my screens open. And, one day, I heard him uh, talking to this, this man who walked by, and he was kind of unpacking all of his woes and difficulties in life to this man who I had uh, prayed for. And that man listened to him in a very loving way for a long time. And then when the man stopped talking, he, he, he just said, can I pray for you? And then he started to share these beautiful ideas. You know, it comes right out, came right out from the Bible. And I think it really helped that man that day. Well, I think the most powerful, influential, wonderful activity in the whole world is something that we have with ourselves 24-7, and it's something that the world thinks is a very namby-pamby, wimpy thing, but it is not. And what I'm talking about is prayer. You know, Jesus, if you just read the Bible with some fresh eyes, uh, you just read, there's four wonderful biographies of this man, Jesus, in this book. And as you read through those biographies, you just see this person walking around and right where people are struggling with the most difficult stuff in life, mental ailments, physical ailments, depression, uh, selfishness. He does this thing mentally, and often moments later, if not instantly, all of a sudden they're feeling healthy and joyous and peaceful, and whole. And this mental thing that he does is captured in that word prayer. Now, if Jesus is the most influential person who ever lived, if he's someone we should look to to, to see how to love and how to live, what did he come as? He wasn't a, a tech entrepreneur. <laughs> he wasn't a, a, a medical physician. You know, he wasn't an actor or a politician. These are often the people we think that are, are powerful or should be famous in our world, right? But Jesus, you could say, was a professional prayer. That's what he did. That's what he did with his life. 
And he taught everyday people just like me and you how to do it. He looked at everyday people like me and you and said, you guys are going to do the same things that he did and even greater. And I think he meant collectively. Now, there's this ubiquitous image of prayer that people have all around the world. You ask a little child to say, uh, you, you say to them, what does it look like for someone to pray? And they'll probably draw what? Yeah, someone with their hands together. What else? Kneeling. Yeah, down on one's knees. What about the eyes? Closed. Eyes closed. Now, there's a lot of variations on this symbol. And, of course, we don't need to be in this physical position to pray. <laughs> the Bible says we should pray without ceasing. Prayer is really a way of viewing life. It's a way of living more than anything. But everything that that symbol connotes does strike at the heart of prayer. What does it represent to be down on one's knees? What's that all about? Humility. Yeah, humility. What did Jesus say? I can of my own self do some things. I'm a good speaker, a good carpenter. But when it gets really tough, I go to God? <laughs> no, he said, I can of my own self do nothing. What amazing words. You know, Jesus was so confident that his words were timelessly true. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. You know, he's probably talking about earth there, like our present experience, heaven, our hopes, our ideals. All that stuff might pass away, but my words will stand there as truth. And he understood better than I think any individual who ever lived that what creates and maintains reality is not a personal mind or ego or psyche. We often walk around in daily life thinking, I'm a little creator. Like, what am I going to do with my life? How can I make a life for myself? You know, what thoughts can I think today? What actions can I do today? As if we're the creator of our own life. But if we're humble, if we just step back, if we get on our knees, so to speak, we can recognize there's something creating everything right now. It's creating the moment. And it's not any one of us. It's not a personal human mind or psyche. Something's creating and governing life. It's not us. Well, what is it? <laughs> we might call it life itself. We all belong to life. We're in it. We're of it. Have we ever felt really close to life? Maybe we were walking out in nature, maybe you're looking out into somebody's eyes, and all of a sudden you don't feel separate from nature or you don't feel separate from the other person. You feel in love. And when the boundaries of life all dissolve and you just feel a part of it, in it and of it, with everyone, that's love. Because life is love. And life and love are God the thing that are, is creating and governing and sustaining existence. Jesus, I believe, knew this more than anyone. Now, what is it to close one's eyes? What does that represent? Quietness. Quietness? Oh, I love that. What else? Shutting out the world. Shutting out the world? Yeah, that's very good. You know, sometimes life doesn't seem like perfect love, does it? There's a lot of images that we see in life that are often the opposite of that, that we see. We're going to explore in this lecture how our physical senses not only cannot in theory or practice show us perfect love because the physical senses are limited. I mean, you can think of all different animals in the animal kingdom who have better senses than we do. You know, they're Animals who see colors that we could barely imagine, who hear things that we could barely imagine. But no matter how good the physical senses are, they can never show us truth because truth is not physical or it's not limited by nature. It's not finite, as we'll see. And often in everyday life, we see things that are the exact opposite of what is true. So there's a reason to block out our material perception of life. Where did Jesus say, we need to go to find heaven. Where is heaven? Within us. The kingdom of heaven is within us. It's good. And what about um, the hands coming together in prayer? What's this all about, you think? 
oneness, togetherness. Oh, I love that. What did Jesus say? I and my Father are two, but when I pray, we're relatively close. <laughs> he said, I and my Father are one. Just one thing. You know, God, this concept of God is the, God is the cause of everything. But every cause needs an effect. There is no effect without a cause, no cause without an effect. Love needs its manifestation, its image, right? And we are that. We are the image and likeness of love, according to the Bible. God needs us to be that image and likeness, to be represented, to be the effect of him or her. So as we journey together uh, through this spiritual adventure here, we're going to see these three themes popping up again and again. A humility, a need to block out what we're physically perceiving as truth, and to understand more about our unity with God, to really understand what truth is and how to experience it fully. So uh, to, to bring this out in living color, we're going to go halfway around the world um, over to the Himalayas. When I graduated college, I just had this penchant for, uh, for traveling, for journeying, for vagabonding. And I saved up a little money, and I took a, a, a coming-of-age adventure halfway around the world, just traveled for about half a year by myself. And, and I really fell in love with the Himalayas, the highest mountains in the world. And I was up there hiking in these little villages. Uh, I especially loved you know, Nepal and India and uh, Tibet and areas of China. And one time I went on a hike out here along the Nepali-Indian border, and I, I came across a little village out there, and I just met this family that was so wonderful, They're just like the most wonderful people in the world. They were just emanating love. And even though we came from a very different religious and spiritual tradition, we had a lot of commonalities, actually. I was surprised. And we stayed up late in the night just talking about all the deep things that matter the most to us, and we were just like instant friends. But they had a brother who was just, he came in, and he seemed to be mentally unwell. And just, he was like a rabid dog or cat, and he just wanted to stay away from us. And every time I tried to talk to him, he would just kind of scurry back into the darkness. And uh, my heart went out to him. I really wanted to help him and see what was going on there. And, you know, so many people struggle with depression in one way or another. And, you know, that little prefix D means of, and pression in the French means pressure. And so to be depressed, it's kind of like defining ourselves by the pressure of the world. If we turn on the news and see all the conflict, all the kind of pressure of two sides pushing up against each other, whether it's in politics and there's one side against another side or different countries uh, fighting against each other, and we see that pressure and we think it's us in one way or another, um, we can feel depressed. If we, can, if it, we feel like there's us versus them mentality or there's God way over there and we're way over here and we're at odds, that sense of duality is the basis of all pressure, conflict, it's the basis of all depression. But what we're exploring in this lecture is, is really how to be the expression of God. And that prefix X means without. Impression means pressure, right? So without pressure. Because if there's only one force in life, and you know what's interesting about this idea about there being one force is if you read the Bible, the Bible is written over thousands of years by people who are rich and poor, people who lived in different countries, people who spoke different languages even. And just imagine how different a book you would write than your grandmother or grandfather would write. <laughs> It'd be so different, right? Mm -hmm. And even though there's so many different kinds of writing as well in this book, there's, there's poetry, there's history books, there's biographies, there's books of revelation from people on islands. <laughs> there's, uh, uh, there's even a book of lamentations. There's all sorts of interesting and strange things in this book. But the one thing that ties it all together is this idea that there is one force or cause or God. And if there's only one force in life, that's the reality at the bottom of everything, there actually is not in truth pressure or conflict, because that takes two forces, right? Well, 
I didn't really get the chance to talk to that man that night, that brother of the wonderful family who seemed to be struggling. But a few days passed, and I was back down in this little town called Darjeeling. You might have heard of it from, uh, for the, from the tea. Uh, it's famous for the tea they make there. And I got a call from the mountaineering guy that I was with on that little trek there, and he said, hey, Nate, you know that guy we met up in the mountains who was all negative? He uh, got into an accident, and he's in the hospital, and I'm going to visit him. Would you like to come with me? And my hotel was on the way. He was going to be walking past me. And I said, sure. And so we went over to this little podunk hospital on the outskirts of this Indian city, and I just was not prepared for what I was about to see. The sights and sounds I witnessed in that hospital, the only thing I could compare it to was Halloween in here, here in America. And this was especially true when I got to this man's uh, sick room. He was tied down to the bed, and he was acting as if he was possessed by a demon. And even though this seemed to be very odd to me, it did not seem to be odd to the people in that room. They are not only taking it very seriously, but it was something that they had seen and witnessed uh, quite a bit in their culture. And what they had seen and witnessed is that when this happened to someone, they would generally stay sick for a few days, and then they would pass on. And that was the pattern that they saw. Now, when we think about observing patterns and regularities in our experience, the word that most people use for that is science. Material science, what it's, a, what it's about is you, you see different variables and different circumstances, and then what is the outcome? And then over time, you can distill that into numbers and into percentages and so forth. We had, uh, you know, we've been dealing with a difficult worldwide pandemic the last few years. And you see this going on a lot. And, and people base their emotions and their actions based upon these patterns and regularities. But when you read the Bible, especially in the life of Jesus, when Jesus saw a pattern that included something ungodlike, something you could call evil or unloving, like sickness and death and, and uh, depression and so forth. Did he ever walk up to someone and say, well, you know, we've seen this happen before. There's a clear pattern of it. So what's probably going to happen is you're going to be sick for a few days and then die. Did Jesus ever say that? When he saw a difficult storm, did he ever say, well, you know, it's hurricane season. We might perish out here. No, he never accepted something ungodlike or unlovelike as normal or natural or the condition that persists after we pray and understand more about God. And when I was in that hospital, I felt a bit like Jesus was described in the Bible when Jesus said, I am not of this world. I don't think he was saying that he was an extraterrestrial. I think what he meant was he wasn't buying into the beliefs of their, the culture about these patterns that people have witnessed with their material senses as the reality and as fact and as absolute truth. He wasn't buying into that. I think what Jesus was buying into was he started thinking and living and being governed not by what he saw, but by divine and infinite love within him. He started with God. Something that this book says, uh, Science and Health, it says, to begin rightly is to end rightly. You know, sometimes when people think of um, God and they hear this concept of this perfect, eternal love, something like that, they think, well, you know, that's kind of far out. How would I know if that even exists? Or, uh, you know, how, that seems kind of abstract or something. <laughs> you know, something that's very concrete when we think about what's true and what's real, is mathematics, right? Um, mathematics is true in all cultures, at all times. If we do any equation, three times three equals nine, it's true for all people under all times and all conditions, right? A you know, small girl in a village halfway around the world you know, 2,000 years ago, and to you know, someone living on Mars 2,000 years in the future, right? That equation is going to be the same, wouldn't you say? When we talk about real hard science, what's ultimately true, we're, we're talking about something that is true under all conditions, all times. And I think Jesus understood this more than anyone, that love is present 
as the defining factor of, of reality under all times, under all conditions. And when I was in that hospital, I saw that man so discordant. But again, I knew that there was more to that story. You know, if you just picture like back in the day when, when people went uh, off to the, to the beach and they saw a flat earth and someone was saying, you know, I've, I've walked 100 miles this way on the beach, looks flat, walked 100 miles the other way, the other guy's like, I've walked 200 miles, still flat, right? And then imagine somebody walking up to them and they say, well, you know, no, I actually think it's a, it's a sphere. And then the other guy is like, wait a minute, so you're saying like halfway around the world someone's just facing down? I don't think so. Uh, you, you think somewhere a quarter way around the world is just like sticking out sideways? No, that's definitely not true, couldn't be. You can imagine how hard that would be to kind of take in just by what you've seen before, you know, the modern age where we have all these different views of the Earth. Now, how did we actually discover for sure that the Earth is, is not flat, it's a, it's a spheroid? How, how do we discover that? Going through space. Going through space? Yeah, but even before that, even before people got to space, kind of figured it out. What is it? Radio waves. People had the courage to travel. People had the courage to travel. Yeah, there's, there was a lot of different, people discovered it from a lot of, in a lot of different ways. You know, truth can be found sometimes from different angles. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, think when, when people think of something that's very dogmatic, it's often when people say there's just one way to get at something. But when you read the Bible, extremely non-dogmatic book, there's four different biographies of Jesus. It's not just like there's one story and this is it, right? They show four stories, and actually they're even like conflicting it sometimes. But imagine if you had somebody, you want to know somebody, who somebody is, if four people described this person from four different angles, you'd get a better sense of the person in the middle, wouldn't you? You're going to see the same is true with God as we get forward here, as we, as we journey forward here, because this is so important that that God, God is love, but there's so many ways to understand God from different angles. This is really what Christian science is at the heart of it, is to really get a full understanding of God in a non-dogmatic way. But back to this point about how do we know if there is this perfect God at the center of everything. Um, you know, with mathematics, you could say that there's a principle of math, Right? There's a principle of math that kind of holds all those numbers in place. Is there an anti-principle of mathematics that causes chaos? There's not, right? Imagine if somebody tried to build this building and they had in their mind, they, they were working with two by, four, two by fours, and as they were measuring those two by fours, you know, they had, maybe they were saying, you know, two plus two equals five or something, and instead of two plus two equals four. They had the wrong mathematical equation in their thought. And as they were measuring those boards, that building, if they put the whole thing together with that in thought, it wouldn't be a strong, stable building. You would be scared to be in here right now, right? If that was the case. But if they held perfect equations in thought as they were building that building from the perfect principle of math, then the building would be strong and stable and you would be happy to stand in here, right? Well, that 2 plus 2 equals 5, it didn't come from an anti-principle of mathematics. It wasn't like a, a good principle and then a bad principle over here kind of working against it to cause discord or destruction. What was that destruction caused by if, you said, if someone built that from the wrong mathematical equations and, and imagine the building fell down? What would that, where would the evil come from? A mistake. A misunderstanding. misunderstanding. Yeah, it says in this book, um, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, it says, it is our ignorance of God, the divine principle, which produces apparent discord, and the right understanding of him restores harmony. The right understanding of God restores harmony. Well, when I was in that room 
with that man who seemed to be demonically possessed and seemed to be the exact opposite of the image of likeness of God, I decided to go home to my hotel room and really pray that night until I felt totally at peace. I actually had a lot of fear. It really caught me, uh, you know, I was not expecting to see what I saw when I walked into the hospital, and I was completely caught off guard, and I had a lot of fear. There's a little acronym for fear. Some of you probably have heard, false evidence appearing real. And even though I saw that, and I, and I felt fear, I knew what I saw and what I felt wasn't coming from God. It was coming from a misperception of life. You know, there's another uh, quote I like in this book, Science and Health, that says, our false views of life hide eternal harmony and produce the ills of which we complain. It's a false view of life. Remember, real life is God. Well, I went back to my hotel room and I really started to pray that night. And I wanted to get the right sense of life in this man's life as the expression of God, of life. And in uh, this book, Science and Health, it defines God as incorporeal, meaning not in a body or form. Because after all, when we talk about something being material or being made of matter, the concept of, of matter is that there is life in one area and not in another. It's like in a finite box. It's here, but it's not there, right? But God is incorporeal, divine, supreme, infinite mind, spirit, soul, principle, life, truth, love. And these words at the bottom of the screen here, these all are seen as synonymous through the discovery of Christian science, that, that God is not only love, but this love is the principle of life. It's that which can be reasoned out from. It's that which can be seen out from. You know, principle is derived from the same word as prime is derived from. And if, there, if you have a prime number, it means you can't reduce it to any other number. It just is. And in every theory of life, you have just to, at one point, just say, well, this just is. You can't reduce it anymore. You can't explain it in terms of, it, terms of anything else. You have to start with something, right? And it's interesting if you kind of think about life as a lot of people these do, uh, a lot of people do these days as just material. Um, if you're a materialist, you would say a human being um, doesn't have a body, they are a body. That's what they are. They're just a physical body. And you could say, oh, what's a physical body made up of? And you could say it's made up of organ systems. Organs are made up of organs. Organ systems are made up of organs. You go all the way down the line, you know, get cells, molecules. You can finally get down to the atom. And when physicists first looked inside the atom, I think that they were expected to see kind of like, you know, the, the stuff of life that everything was made up of. They thought, oh, everything was made up of atoms. We look inside of it, we're probably going to see this kind of bursting life force that everything is made up of. And when they looked inside of it, you know what they saw? That it was 99.99999, lots of nines, empty space. In biblical language, you could say, Adam, where art thou? <laughs> And if you didn't catch the joke there, uh, if you read this book, <laughs> the Bible, the first chapter says that we're the image and likeness of God. Second chapter uh, gives a totally different vision of God. It gives this dualistic, capricious, good and bad God, a God that's present, sometimes not present sometimes, loving sometimes, hateful at other times. And then out of that concept of God comes this man, Atom that's both made up of the dust or the matter of the ground, but also seems to have a spirit or spiritual side. And then this Adam man, he seems to be awake at some times, but he seems to be asleep at other times. <laughs> and right away, he falls asleep. And the first thing he dreams is that woman was created to serve him. He must have been dreaming. <laughs> and then his, uh, his progeny, his kids, start to believe in this kind of zero-sum contest that we have to fight for the good in the world because it's in matter. So if, if the good is in a piece of land or in a, a coin or whatever, we need to fight for it, right? And this false sense of competition arises. This false sense of conflict starts to arise from this dualistic vision of life. Well, 
when I was praying for that man who had been sick in the hospital there, I was getting rid of all dualism in my thought. And I was really starting with this concept that there is one thing going on, one cause, pure monotheism, the basis of everything in the Bible. There's one God, one source, one creator, one thing going on. And as I started to really internalize that, I started to recognize that if love is the only cause, this man had to be feeling and experiencing that love as the very substance of his being. If God was life, life was all that there is. So this man was alive. He was living, living in love. That if this, uh, you know, this it, soul is the source of everything, this man was soulful. He was beautiful. He was good. And as I was just trying to pray in this simple kind of childlike way, I could feel all the fear just dissolving in my thought. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. I could start to feel that sense of wholeness. It's interesting if you look up the etymology of words like wholeness and holiness and wholesomeness. You know, they all seem to be related in how they're uh, created in different languages. Because to be whole is to be in truth. It's like, you know, when our lives seem to fall flat, that flatness is like a flat earth, right? And I think disease and discord and discomfort and uh, mental ailments, it's all like falling flat. But the real vision of us is always whole and holy. And as I started to get that sense that this man was only made and created by God, I eventually, you know, fell asleep that night peacefully, and I let my prayer go. And a few days passed, uh, and I found myself hiking back in that area. I was going on a longer trek now, and I realized I was going to pass by that man's village where I originally met him. And I thought, oh, I can stop in and see how the family is and, and uh, see how that guy is doing. And before I even got to the front door, that man who had been so sick in the hospital was already back in his village. And not only was he back in his village outside, but he had this winsome smile on his face. It looked like he was on cloud nine. Completely different demeanor. And the family told me how this was just such a miracle they couldn't believe it. But it wasn't supernatural. It was super natural. Most natural thing in the world. And it was interesting. I remember years after that happened, I always felt strange about this particular experience. You know, kind of feeling that like my prayer somehow healed this man. That never just felt right to me. And after a while, I said, yeah, duh. <laughs> um, it was God who healed this man, not me. You know, healing is actually not changing reality at all. It's just seeing reality for what it is. You don't change a flat earth to a spheroid by getting a higher and correct view of it. And you're not the cause of making the earth a sphere when you get a high view of it. If you went out to outer space, you wouldn't say, oh, I just made that earth a sphere, right? It was me, I did it. No, you're not the creator of that. But beholding it from the right point of view can bring it into present experience in a way that's harmonious. Like the plane that I flew over uh, here from Chicago, if, the, if I went up to the cockpit and I said, hey, um, you know, excuse me, pilot, uh, you know, I've been walking around today. The earth just seems very flat. I know you, you guys all talk about the spheroid thing. I've seen the pictures. But maybe just put into your GPS like it's 90% a spheroid, but let's, let's, let's keep 10% flat, right? Imagine if you put that into the GPS. We wouldn't have e ended up in LAX, right? We wouldn't have got to our perfect destination, destination. You have to go all in on the side of truth. It's not like there's a mixture of the Earth being flat and a spheroid. One is the incorrect vision and one is the correct vision. And you have to go all in, calculate on the right side to get harmonious results. And this is the same thing that we learn about in Christian science. Now, what's interesting is that sometimes I, I give a lecture like this, and at the end of the talk, someone will say, well, Nate, I enjoyed this speech, 
enjoy the time. But, you know, I, I, I'm dealing with some of my own stuff. You know, I've got a problem myself. You know, how can I reach out to others in prayer and expect healing when I'm dealing with my own problem? Well, Apostle Paul is a good example in the Bible. He was dealing with a problem in his life, and he still went out there and helped and healed people again and again. But I was actually dealing with a problem when that healing occurred that I just shared with you. Uh, when I was over in the Himalayas, every time I got to, up to the high altitudes, I would get terribly ill. Now, I had these two books with me. I had my trusty Bible, and I had this companion book, Science and Health is Key to the Scriptures. And just to paraphrase, Jesus said in the book of John, he essentially said, I'm not going to be with you forever, but don't worry. I will send you a comforter. Talked about it as the spirit of truth, something that would help you remember him. He implied it was something that would help you understand his teachings. And when Mary Baker Eddy uncovered the science, you know, the logic, the true learnability of healing prayer, in the way that Jesus did it. Uh, she felt that that was a natural fulfillment, that that really would bring divine comfort to people's lives. And it certainly did for me when I was up in those mountains, when I read these two books together. Every single time I could tell you about some insight or some wonderful experience I had through prayer when I was up there reading through those books. And I got through every difficult time and never had to turn back early on any hike. But that problem of getting terribly ill again and again and again. It just kept happening. I loved hiking so much that I kept doing it, but, uh, and I kept praying about it, and I was learning, but the problem didn't fully go away. Now, it all came to a head at the end of my six-month journey. For the last month, I wanted to take a month-long mountaineering course in Himalayan India. And I went to take a course there, and I had been training, you know, I had hiked all these mountains. It was in the best shape, best shape of my life. I showed up at this course, and the day before, I didn't know this was going to happen, but they said, you have to take a physical exam, make sure everything's okay. And I took the exam, and the doctor uh, said, Nate, you're in great shape, but um, we got an alarm going off. It's a good part of the lecture, maybe. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but he said, you have a, you, you failed the test. He said, you've got a blood problem. He said, there's not enough hemoglobin in your blood. You have not enough oxygen in your red blood cells. And he described it to me and gave me further labels. And he said, you know, you failed. And I was thinking, oh, gosh, you know, I just didn't expect this. And he was kind of scratching his head of what he could do and how he could help. A really uh, sweet man. And he said, well, you've come so far. You know, you've traveled from America. You know, maybe there's some pills you could take for this. You know, you can always hike down. What if I just lie for you? And I thought to myself, well, you know, Jesus in the Bible, he didn't say you would know the lie and the lie would somehow get you out of this one. <laughs> he said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And actually in this book, Science and Health, Mary Baker Eddy says honesty is spiritual power. And so I was grateful that he was trying to help me, but I, I knew that that wasn't the route I wanted to take. But I just asked him kindly if I could just take a walk and pray about this, and if I could come back a little bit later. And he said, oh yeah, that's fine, that's fine. So as I took a walk, I, I remember distinctly that day just seeing light just pour through the trees in such a beautiful way. And what's interesting is that when you read the Bible, there's all these like, you know, you, you get these amazing visions of Christ Jesus. And you, and you look at this guy, and you, hear, you read the Bible, and you're like, this is the Son of God. And then you think, you know, this is the image and likeness of God. You know, when you read the Bible and you see the life of Jesus. And, and you think, you know, he was the light of the world. The Bible says he's the light of the world. But what was interesting is that even though Jesus' life is irreplaceable and he was the Messiah, Messiah, he showed in living color what it looks like to be a full and complete transparency of divine, unconditional love, all those descriptions the Bible also says are true about us. We are the image and likeness of God, first page. Jesus looked upon his disciples, said, you are the light of the world, following my teachings. And throughout, it talks about each and every one of us, you know, sons and daughters of God. 
And I love this idea about light, uh, light of the world. You know, if you saw a light beam come through a window and you saw, uh, you said to that light beam, you got bad blood, you're no good, wouldn't change that light beam at all, would it? If you uh, walked up to that light beam, tried to physically manipulate it, abuse it, you know, harm it, you know, put some medicine in it, whatever it might be, it wouldn't change it or stop it from shining, would it? What if you put that light beam into a box, bring it into another room, labeled it, you know, specimen B, light beam, and you open up that box, would the light beam be in there? It wouldn't be in there, would it? What's so interesting is if you think about identity and about how we define ourselves and other people moment to moment, you probably will come across these three things very quickly. Well, you know, what am I, what am I defined by? Well, what people have said about me, maybe doctors or educators or uh, people who are no more than I do. Um, you know, what am I defined by what happened to me physically, by what's kind of gone inside of me physically, what's occurred to me who or what has touched me. You might think about uh, how the world has boxed me in, this age, this race, this part of town, these proclivities, this academic history, whatever it might be. You know, these little finite descriptions, little boxed in descriptions. But why is the light beam not defined by what's said to it, by what's physically occurred to it in the past, or by trying to box it in? What is it defined by if not those three things? Its source, which is what? The sun. And how many um, craters, you could say, does it have? Just one, the sun. And without going into all the physics, physics of it, you could say the sun creates that light beam as its own expression, brand new every moment, right? You put your hand up to the, to the sun. The second you take it down, the, why, the reason why it's shining is because that light beam is brand new right out from its source, continually. Does that make sense? And, you know, what's interesting is, you know, the, at the very end of the Bible, it's this beautiful, the Bible ends in this beautiful way in the book of Revelation. It essentially says, you know, all of our visions of incompleteness, death, decay, they're all going to pass on. And then it says, behold, I, God, make all things new. The sense of perpetual newness. And as I was praying for myself that day when I was walking out there, praying about that issue with my, my blood there, I was again going back to God. And instead of starting with what someone said about me or what my physical experience was or how I seemed boxed in by different things, compressed or depressed by life, I started from God and then thought about myself as an expression of God brand new every moment. Everything that was substance about me, that was good about me, uh, come, came from God and, and from my, the right understanding of God. The right understanding restores harmony. The right understanding restores harmony. It's interesting, that word understanding and substance are really the same thing. Understanding and true substance same thing. You know, if we want to know what our true substance is, we need to understand our source, understand God. And as I was starting with those concepts for God and really understanding that I was the ever new expression of God, again, I started to feel this sense of wholeness, oneness. You know, when, we, when you, you think of that sphere, it's like one, one thing, right? And I eventually went back to that doctor and I just had this spiritual audacity, you could say. I just knew everything was going to work out. I had no idea how, but I just walked there just knowing that everything was going to work out. And, and the doctor said, okay, well, I'll just write you a recommendation. You can hand it in and see what they say. And I said, great. And I handed it in. They, they ended up letting me in. And when I got up to the high altitudes for the first time, not only was I not ill when I got up to those altitudes, but I felt real health, real health. When people often talk about health, they just talk about it in this very wimpy, superficial way often, that the health is just 
the physical body functioning in a way that we find acceptable, right? Nothing's bothering me too much. Yeah, I'm healthy, right? It's not what health is. Health, real health is, is not a physical thing at all. It's really the consciousness of God. When we're consciousness of what is true, the source of life, when we're conscious of love, we're healthy. And the body follows. <laughs> the body follows along. You know, if you've ever been in just like a really sweet, loving, pure state of consciousness, you might fall asleep and in your dream, you find yourself moving around in a body that is very harmonious. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Or uh, conversely, if you're in a state of agitation and anxiety and in this illusion of, of duality and conflict and a bad state of mind, you might fall asleep and find yourself in this dream where you're, you have this body that's not working very well. Now, the body is, is actually within mind, within consciousness. You know, when I'm talking to you right now, I should first start to say that, you know, the prevalent belief in our world today is that, you know, the world is material. Things are made of matter, right? And people are, are they talk about the hard problem of consciousness. <laughs> Because philosophers can't describe consciousness in material terms, even in theory. That's not a surprise to me, because it's consciousness which creates and governs all. And this is very, very clear, even in the simplest ways. You know, when I'm talking to you right now, there's first an idea, there's a thought, right? I have a thought. A thought comes. And then the thought is manifested with me moving my mouth, and my hands are moving, and you're hearing, and you're understanding your but it first starts a thought, and then there is a form that expresses that thought. Does that make sense? And that form that expresses my thought, that's my current conception of body. But the body is something that is subservient to, to mind, to thought. Now, this person who discovered Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy, was a deep and profound thinker. You know, I've read many biographies about her. Uh, recently, I, I gave a talk where I, I shared some of, of this book, uh, Christian Healer. And she was, um, there's a lot of biographies written about her, uh, but this one is interesting in that it catalogs over 300 healing experiences that came through her own prayers. And in the back of the book, there's a little index. And if you just uh, go to the index under healings, I often read the A's and B's, but I'll, I'll read the C's and D's for you today. Uh, it's quite a list. Um, there's a healing in here of uh, cancer of the chest, cancer of the face, cancer of the neck, spider cancer, stomach cancer, throat cancer, cancer while someone was preaching, cataract of the eye, chronic disease, chronic trouble, a lot of cases of cold, the effects of cold temperature, consumption, tuberculosis, convulsions, cough, coughing, favorite cousin was healed, a crippled boy, crippled man, crushed by wagon, many cases of people who had crushes, crutches who didn't need them anymore after Mary Baker already prayed for them. A crying infant, a cyclone, that was the C's, most of the C's. Uh, dead boy, dead girl, a deaf girl, deformed and crippled man, deformed man with withered limbs, degenerative bone disease, delirium from fever, dental pain, diabetes, discouragement, dislike of Mrs. Eddy, dropsy, dry well, drying case, <laughs> dying case, uh, lots of dying cases, dyspepsia. Okay, that was not even all the C's and D's. Um, Mary Baker Eddy healed through prayer things that were given up by the medical field. Uh, she healed people in, in the most difficult human experiences and brought them to, to full and in, in complete health through prayer alone. And yet, she didn't talk about herself as Christian healer, Mary Baker Eddy, even though this book is called Christian Healer. You don't see her say, Christian healer, comma, Mary Baker Eddy, in her writings. What you see again and again is the discoverer of Christian science, also the founder of the Christian science movement. And she found that this discovery was such an important thing for the world. You know, you can imagine, well, I'll say this. Uh, when I was in college, I went to take one of the most difficult polyrhythmic music classes that you could take. It's, this is uh, music from 
called, uh, from Ghana, Togo, and Benin called Ebwe. It's the most, one of the most complex polyrhythmic musics in the world. And I got to this class and I thought, uh, there was people showing up who had no musical background at all. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm probably not going to be able to play this music, even though I have a musical background. And then I looked at the people coming in, and I thought, there's no way that person's going to be able to play. No way that person's going to do it. No way that person's going to do it. And I was so judgmental. And then the teacher walked in, and she just taught it like a language. And she had such a love for this music, and she knew that everyone could do it. In a similar way that, uh, you know, I've got a little five-year-old daughter at home, and, you know, her little kindergarten class, the teacher doesn't say, okay, who of you can learn English? <laughs> no, they, he knows that they all can learn English. That there's a science of language. There's rules to grammar. Anyone can understand. They're intuitive. It, it's within us all to be able to learn and speak and communicate something natural. And my music teacher knew that same thing. And it blew my mind seeing how all these people broke out of the box that they had of whether they were gifted or not as musicians. Often when people think about spiritual healing or Christian healing, they think it's either a mystery, it's a gift, or it's based upon some kind of creed, you know, knowing the right words or writing on the dotted line that I believe this, this thing or I accept this thing. And Mary Baker already sa saw and really discovered and, and mined this, the reality of this for the truth of it, namely that healing through prayer, there is a really a science of love behind it, that it's actually innate to all of us, that healing, again, it's not changing reality, it's seeing life as harmonious and loving from the one source as it always truly is. And I've worked at lots of uh, Christian science camps for kids. And I've seen little kids intuitively learn this very quickly and heal things which adults thought were impossible. I could tell you some stories that would make you cry. Um, well, Mary Baker Reddy, she really felt that this breakthrough was so important because, you know, the world, we all struggle with so many difficulties in life. And often we just think, and just reach for different material solutions. And we don't always find a resolution. And even if we do, it's often kind of a patchwork kind of thing. We might solve things on the surface for a little bit, but don't, we don't really get to the root of what life is all about. Do I feel that wholeness and love inside, that meaning inside, that goodness inside? Well, Christian science is it's an inside-out healing, transforms us within, and then it it makes us express the love. It goes into action. You know, I was reading this biography before this lecture started. It's called Rolling Away the Stone, Mary Baker Eddy's Challenge to Materialism. And um, this little line struck me. She said, language, as Eddy understood it, whether in teaching or writing, was intimately related to action. If it was authentic, it reflected the life behind it and could reach the heart. And for her, words, when you read like this book, Science and Health, it's not just philosophy or nice like a combination of ideas that kind of make a mental model of reality. She, you know, like the Bible, it says, you know, the letter can kill, but the spirit gives life. And when she talks about Christian science, she says it's humanly something that we can apply. She implies it's it's something humanly that we can apply, like any science, mathematics or physics, something we can work out, you know, design things in line with, design our lives in line with, so they're harmonious. But she says divinely, science is the atmosphere of God. It's the atmosphere of what is true. It's what we're living in. You know, science, it's, it's, it's ultimately about what is true about everything right now, right? Now, one of the things that's so interesting about Mary Baker Eddy that I admire so much is that when I was in college, I, I was actually asking all the big questions about why we're here, how can we do the most good, you know, is there a God out there? I wasn't a Christian scientist at the time in my life. I knew nothing about it, never even heard the words. But I started to study what's called perennial philosophy. It's kind of an approach of world religion looking at the truths, the ethics, the healing experiences 
seemed to pop up again and again throughout the ages. I was on a deep quest to discover universal truth. And I didn't think I was going to find any one perspective that would be the end all for me. But during that time, I came across this book, Science and Health. And it really felt like a coming home experience to me. And I started to witness all sorts of healings just by getting the spirit of the words. I didn't understand a lot of the concepts at first. But just through getting the spirit of the words, all sorts of wonderful things happened to me. I won't tell you them all tonight. But uh, one of them was I had a shoulder injury that sidelined me when I was 13 years old. I, had to, I was on all these traveling sports teams, and I loved it. It was my whole life. And I got this injury, and the doctor told me I, I couldn't play any sports, that I had to use my right arm anymore. And I was crying on the way back from the doctor's office. And, um, you know, my life pivoted. I got into other things. But in the background, that was always causing me issues. It wasn't a big problem, but it was always kind of hurting me in the background. It co continued all the way into college. But as I was reading that book, all the pain just disappeared, never to return. Now, one of the things that I find so unique and helpful about Mary Baker Eddy is that even though I had studied all these saints and sages and yogis from different traditions, one thing I saw again and again, this kind of <laughs> perennial pitfall of spiritual, uh, spiritual history, you could say, was that when someone would have some kind of enlightening moment, or they would somehow catch a little bit of what Mary Baker Eddy called the perfection that underlies reality. Without perfection, nothing is wholly real. When someone got a glimpse of that and started to live a life of love, which has happened in many different traditions, you know, many people who have uh, really caught that life is love and, and have really lived a life of love and had a, been a tremendous healing experience for people. Well, what often happens is that people get addicted to their personality. And I, I saw a documentary recently about a particular spiritual individual who people so wanted to get in the presence of that they would break the law and do terrible things to get at the feet of this master. And the master, this particular <laughs> spiritual master, you could say, um, didn't seem to protect them, these devotees, um, of uh, not doing that. But Mary Baker Eddy, she was very, very different. Um, like Jesus, she really tried to bring out the best in every person and not to make just another intermediary between them and God, but she wanted to show them their direct relationship to truth. That they were, each and every one of us, and the people who Mary Baker Eddy were speaking to, they were the direct expressions of God without any intermediary. Now, I love how this is captured in this one particular story, I'll tell you. And then, uh, if you'd like, we can open it up to any questions that any of you might have. There was a woman named Harriet O'Brien. She lived when Mary Baker Eddy was alive. Mary Baker Eddy was alive from 1821 till 1910. And this woman, Harriet O'Brien, she lived in Kansas City. And interestingly, she just got one difficult ailment after the next. It just it was this life of woe. And chronic spine issues, chronic heart issues. She picked up what's called an iatrogenic ailment, something caused by medical intervention and went awry. And she was relegated to a wheelchair. She was so ill, um, her mo motor movements broke down. She stopped speaking normally. And she, in her own words, was at death's throes when she encountered Christian Science Prayer. Someone started to pray for her, who was taught by Mary Baker Eddy, and quickly she started to revive. Uh, she started to revive so quickly that I think she started to have hope that she could even walk again. And it didn't come quickly, that part of the healing didn't, but she prayed month after month, and eventually she got out of that wheelchair, started to walk normally. She said she had been so ill, she had to relearn how to write and relearn how to talk. And she did. And in fact, she became quite a successful woman. She worked personally for Mary Baker Eddy. But right after that healing, she, I think she really wanted to meet Mary Baker Eddy, like as if it was like to get to the source, right? Who was this woman, after all, who discovered this amazing thing who, that ended up healing me, right? You can imagine her asking these questions. Well, she went to meet her, and she just had this brief encounter with her. But this is what she said about this uh, wonderful encounter. She said, 
Transparency is the word that best expresses my impression of Mrs. Eddy. Instinctively, I felt her great love, and I was conscious that no one I had ever seen loved me as much as she did. My entire thought was filled with a spiritual illumination, and there was a glory in the sunshine and landscape as though a breath of heaven had swept earth and enveloped me. And she goes on in this account to talk about, in that moment, she realized the difference between someone made in the image and likeness of God and a vision of someone as just material. She realized the difference between those two things. Remember how I started the lecture, you can only take one? Better take the right one. <laughs> Better choose the right one. Well, Harriet O'Brien said when she met Mary Baker Eddy, she had a question in her heart. And the question was, can I be a healer too? And she said, the moment she met Mary Baker Eddy, without words being exchanged, she said that question for her was answered. And she hopped on a train shortly after, went back to her hometown, Kansas City, and started a public practice of Christian science healing. And she advertised as a Christian science practitioner for over 50 years and left a wonderful record of healing. And she talks about, and this is recorded in, uh, partly in this book, Christian Healer. It's also on, in the Christian Science periodicals. You can access jsh.christianscience.com. She talks about on several occasions, she helped people who seemed to be on their deathbed just like she was, once was. She helped them through prayer alone revive to a state of health and peace. Isn't that wonderful? Well, prayer, it really is something we all have 24-7 at our fingertips. This ability to get humble, to close our eyes to anything that we see that's ungodlike, and to understand more about our oneness with God. And Christian science really does unlock the spiritual meaning of the Bible and, and concepts that help us understand this more thoroughly and, and how to put it into action in our lives. So before I put a little bow tie on this lecture, does anyone have any questions out there? Anything that they're thinking about? Anything that they wanted me to cover before I close it up? Thank you for asking that. He said, what words do you actually use when you pray? Um, can, you have, can you give a sample prayer? You know, there are a lot of wonderful words in the Bible. The 23rd Psalm, 91st Psalm, Lord's Prayer, uh, all things worth memorizing. Uh, in, in Science and Health, the Scientific Statement of Being is a wonderful thing to look at. There are a lot of words that we can find helpful. Sometimes I just ask God what I need to know and open up those books, and often words that I need to hear, uh, I'm just led to. But the key here is that if, you know, prayer is really about our relationship with God. It's about finding our oneness with God. It's about getting a perfect relationship with God, getting in tune with God, right? And if I asked you what words make a perfect relationship with someone, what would you say? Trust. trust. trust? Well, if I just walked up to someone and said trust or love. Well, you know, like there are probably words that are good, like, you know, I love you, I'm grateful for you, how can I help? <laughs> you know, all sorts of words that are, are good prompts for a good relationship with someone or, or with God. But to have a perfect relationship, let's just take a person, for example. Say if you're trying to have a perfect relationship with someone. Um, there's no words that, that automatically create a perfect relationship. You could say, I love you. I'm so grateful for you. It's not going to do much, right? <laughs> In fact, uh, that might even work against you. Um, it's more about the motive, right? It's about the desire. It's about... If you read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, if you haven't read your Bible in a while, wonderful place to start. I often call it Jesus' Greatest Hits. And uh, as you read that, it's, it's like uh, it starts off with these conditions of thought 
that really bring you to the divine, this sense of being humble and poor in spirit and really striving for, to know truth and to be a peacemaker and all those conditions of thought that those human um, beautiful qualities that lead us up to the divine. But if you think about what creates a perfect relationship, uh, I often like to, to think about it as analogous to the very first line of Science and Health where it talks about prayer. It says, the prayer that reforms the sinner and heals the sick is an absolute faith that all things are possible to God, a spiritual understanding of him, an unself love. And I think what makes for a great relationship is to have an absolute faith in someone, to really be there for them when no one else is, to really trust in them. And it's not a faith that's just blind, but it's based upon understanding them. And what does that take? It makes, takes non-judgmental listening, takes being there, quality time to really get to know them. It takes you know, practical care. And of course, it takes love that's not a bargain deal, a real love that's sourced in God. And, you know, I just saw that Bible movie on the airplane over here, and I was thinking about, you know, who did Jesus resurrect to? It was all these people who had just said, I don't even know this guy on his darkest hour, right? All given up on him. And yet Jesus came back to them. Why did he do that? Because I think he had an absolute faith in them. He really trusted them. He saw the best in them. He understood who they really were as expressions of God, and he loved them. And so to come back to your original question, you know, when we talk about, you know, what words <laughs> do we say, you know, they have to come from God, not a person, right? And so, you know, every day often I just pray in the morning, you know, God, give me an idea that I can hold on to. It's like, a, like a, if you were out at sea and there's waves all around you in all directions, if someone threw you a little buoy, you would hold on to that buoy until you are completely saved and out of the water. And I often think that, you know, we see destruction and discord all around us, but once we get that word of God, we just hold on to it until we feel rescued. And so sometimes it's the simplest words. It's just that, you know, life is love, no matter what I see. Life is love. You know, that... Um, it can be the simplest words that come to us, but it's often we hold on to them humbly and truly until we start to feel that they have delivered us or until the next right words come. Yeah. When you were talking about the sunbeams and the idea of um, knowing who our, what our identity is, and um, I'd love to hear what you say about being sort of consistently aware of what, that there's only one of us and who we really are and at the same time countering what seems to constantly be coming from the world in terms of distraction or just, you know, you were saying, you know, that the world believes that we are matter and material. So it seems yet 24-7, right? So I just would love to hear your thoughts on that and the consistency. Yeah, she's asking with that light beam analogy, how do you more consistently think about yourself as coming from God, as, as spiritual? That's what that analogy represented. And to cut out the dis distracting thoughts that constantly bombard us about our life being incomplete or material. Uh, well, I'm working on it, <laughs> like all of us, I think, or many of us. Um, I, I think it's... It, it, it's just going back to that simplest of concepts that I'm trying to get across in this lecture. You know, as I noted in this book, it says to begin rightly is to end rightly. And so often, even with good intentions, I think about helping the world in some way, but I'm holding in thought some incomplete vision of the world or incomplete vision of people as good and bad, right? There's this dualistic thing. And so I think the most important thing, you know, the simple lesson I just keep learning more about is just to go back to pray fundamentally when you pray is just to begin with God, to feel this all-absorbing one love that's at the source of everything, that this love is the soul, you know, create, source of all creativity and artistry and beauty. And therefore, life is artistic. It's beautiful. It's creative. Uh, it's good. It's entirely good. 
And so it's, it keeps starting with God. And so that's why often just quiet, humble prayer is so important. And it's also important just to, um, you know, there are all these sneaky little ideas that come into our thought. One that I often see in, in very spiritual cultures, uh, even in the Christian science community often, is this, this kind of idea that, well, there's kind of an on and off switch to prayer. People will say, well, you know, I, I can't pray because that person over there, is, you know, doesn't want my prayer. Uh, there's a difference between Christian science treatment and Christian science prayer. If someone calls a practitioner, uh, there are practitioners all over the world that can help you through prayer. You can find them on jsh.christianscience.com. And uh, if you call a practitioner and you ask them to pray for you, to give you Christian science treatment, you're giving them consent to move your thought to a more spiritual place. So as you talk to them, they might recognize places in your thought that, uh, that where your thought needs to move. And they, you're giving them consent to help them, help them move your thought. Now, you generally don't do that to somebody without their consent. But when Mary Baker Eddy, when she talks about prayer, she always uses the golden rule. You know, if I got hit by a bus and I was unconscious, I hope you would all, you wouldn't just say, oh, he didn't, uh, he's not asking for consent, I'm going to walk by. You know, I would hope that you would all stop and pray for me there, right? So it's the golden rule. But, but more than that, there's no off switch to general prayer because prayer is just seeing life as spiritual. You don't see life as spiritual and then say, oh, this person doesn't want me to pray for them, so I'm going to see them as a failing mortal. That's not what you do. Uh, you see life as it is, as spiritually. You don't try to consciously move someone's thought without their permission, but you always strive to pray without ceasing. And so that's to continually keep that vision of everything being made of, of love, everybody having a unique place in creation, being loved, like every number in the number system is needed. Okay, last question in the back. Yes, she's asked him, how do you pray for the bigger stuff, the world at large? Thank you. That's a great question to end on. Um, you know, not just yourself, your family, but how do you tackle the big stuff? You know, one of the things that I really admire about Mary Baker Eddy is that the last thing that she did, or basically the last big accomplishment she did in her life, um, in her upper 80s, was she created the award-winning newspaper, Christian Science Monitor, because she was thinking in these this broad, big sense of how can this help the whole world. And I've really admired, I've known a lot of journalists for the Monitor, and many people have worked there. And, you know, they're not trying to avoid the difficult stuff in life, but they're trying to really pinpoint people who are actually looking for solutions and actually helping things on the ground right where they are and, and looking beyond just an us-versus-them mentality to what are the kind of conditions and solutions that could really bless everyone. Um, you know, she talks about that paper um, with that motto, injure no one um, but to, to bless all, ma all mankind. And to injure no man but to bless all mankind. And there's also, I, I, think, um, I think there's two sides to that question. One, we want to recognize that what's true at a small scale is true at a big scale, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4, uh, and then 2 million plus 2 million equals 4 million, you know, it's what's true in the small is true in the big. But, um, you know, sometimes we get wrapped up in, you know, there are a lot of people in the world called to do a lot of different things. And we want to ask God, you know, what is our mission? And even in the day, you know, what is our mission today? And Jesus was very present with every person that he met. He wasn't just thinking about like, oh, what, how am I going to change the Roman army, you know? He was like, this person is struggling in front of me, and I'm going to help them. 
and I'm, that's going to mean the world to them in this situation. And it's like uh, the world is changed in that kind of humble way. You know, it's like that he gives all these parables about like the leaven, you know, or a little seed, you know, transforming into a big thing. And so we always want to get ahead of ourselves. So that's one part of the question. But it's also, you know, when we pray, God makes the big um, come to us in a way that we can grapple with. So, you know, for example, when the Ukraine war um, started, uh, I was really feeling that exact way that you were feeling. Like, this is so big. How can I help? What could I do? It seems so kind of foreign and distant from me. And so I was praying, you know, essentially to... To, to, I was, God, you know, make this real for me. How can I help? And I went to a little park with my daughter, and my daughter started to play with this little boy, and then I started to talk to the father of the little boy, and I started to tell him, you know, what was on my thought. I said, you know, gosh, such difficult stuff we're seeing on the news. You know, I'm struggling with it. And he said, I'm Ukrainian. And he said, I'm all my friends, family, Ukrainian, I worked my whole life in Russia. Uh, and he said, no one wants this war. And when he said that, it, like, it just struck to the bone to me because I, I love that story in the Bible about the, the woman who was brought before Jesus to be stoned, the adulterous woman. And, you know, there's two sides there. You know, they're at kind of war, you know, the Romans and the Jews, opposite sides, so much tension. Uh, Jews under Roman occupation, and the, the law for the Romans was you, you can't stone anyone, you'll be jailed. And to the Jews, that if you caught a, a woman in an adulterous act, you have to stone her. So to Jesus, whatever he said, he was going to get in trouble by one of them, right? And so he just gets humble, he gets down on his knees, he's like on, riding on the ground, you know, it's humble. And this, these, these words come, I'm talking about the right words. Um, these words come to Jesus that diffuses the whole situation. You know, whoever doesn't have sin, cast the first stone. Everybody walks away. There was these words that came that brought healing. But then Jesus walks up to this woman, and, you know, it says everybody walked away, but I'm sure people were like, what's this guy going to say, right? <laughs> you know, somebody wrote down the story after all. Um, and he says, where are your accusers? And the woman looks out, and I'm sure she saw people still, but she said, I, I, I see no one. And it was like the same thing that guy said to me on the, the playground that day. And for me, that was just, that's been a prayer for me ever since then. Like, no one wants this in their hearts. And there's been a lot of examples, you know, where things have been diffused already in that difficulty on, on what seemed to be a very large scale. Um, and, a, and a lot of a lot of good we can be grateful for and we can continue to build on. So um, when we pray about things, God has a way of kind of bringing it to us in a way that it's meaningful and make us feel that we have traction in our prayers. And um, it's hard to know sometimes when we pray about things on a big scale, we can't know that how, how it worked out, but we can just put a period on our prayer and know that it works. Um, there's a thing called simultaneous invention theory that shows a lot of big inventions, even before the internet and things, that once somebody invented things, it was like that idea was available around the world because people just started inventing it all at the same time. And it's like, so when you have a good thought, you know, that thought's available. It's out there. It's, it's affecting people. And, and you can know that. So, um, you know, everything I've been talking about today, it's right in this book, Science and Health. Um, you know, that faith, understanding, and love, that's something we can, we can just go deeper into. We can really have this absolute faith in God that's based upon this true understanding of love, and we can start to live that love in an unselfed way. And as we do that, we'll see that healing is not just a one-time thing, but we can really live a life of prayer, a life of healing. The Reading Room Across the Street has free copies of this book, Science and Health. So if you haven't read this before, I hope you pick one up on the way out. I hope you thank this church for sponsoring this wonderful talk. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being out there and doing good in the world. Thank you so much.